Welcome to the E-Lines Law Podcast, where we discuss the study of law with or without law school and using an evidence-based approach to your life. Hello, I'm Michael Eline, and I am the host of the 10-Minute Law School from the podcast called E-Lines Law, which is a new podcast that I'm doing. And it's to help people out so they can learn about the study of law or learn about recent events and how to apply the law to it. The idea is is to understand using the practical application of law, the rules of evidence, and all of the other things that you need to be a full-bodied lawyer with the full knowledge to take on the court system, contracts, torts, criminal law. And we're going to start with Our very first episode, which is about, should I even choose law as a career? Just to give you a little bit of information about me, I became a lawyer with no undergrad, with no real formal training. I studied in a law office the old-fashioned way, uh, similar to how they did it back in the days of the Knights Templar, who are our first law school houses, so to speak. And we'll get into that in some other episodes. But before I begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research on the Law Office Study Program or my job as a personal injury attorney at Eline Law Firm. It is, however, my desire to bring zero-cost consumer information about the law to the general public. In keeping with that theme, here is episode one, of the 10-minute law school series. And of course, I may not be able to get this done in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try to get it done in under 10 or a little bit over. But we'll just call it the 10-minute law series for lack of a better word. So let's begin. So first of all, I was a manual laborer. I was a Marine. I owned several small businesses, including a limousine company. I sold earthquake braces after the Loma Prieta earthquakes in 94. I've done all kinds of stuff, managed uh, health clubs all over the country, uh, been in sales, used to do sales seminars, sold cars. So I've been around in the real world, which I feel gives me a, a better understanding of what's going on with normal people. So I, I have a easier time relating to my clients than I do to other attorneys. So forgive me if I don't talk too much like I would if I was in court. I just like to be me. So the first thing I want to tell you is that I've always had a passion and interest for the law. So that'll be our first bullet point is you need to have a passion and interest if you want to be a lawyer. Just like if you wanted to be a Marine. If you want to be the best, you have to have a passion and interest. And just having that passion and interest, I mean, a lot of people say, yeah, you know, I was going to be a Marine or I wanted to be a Marine, guys who were in the Army or the Navy, but they didn't make that step for whatever reason. So we've all heard that. And so just having a passion and interest doesn't mean you're going to do it. So you have to ask yourself, do you have a genuine interest in the law and the legal system? Studying law requires dedication, major perseverance, and a deep curiosity about legal principles, cases, and their impact on society as a whole, your family, and everyone else around you. So make sure you have a genuine passion for the subject matter. And and one of the other reasons why is because distractions are something that will prevent you from becoming a lawyer. Anyone can go to a junior college and get a degree in basket weaving or some kind of cultural studies or whatever, but that's not probably going to get you a job unless you want to get a job working on a college campus. Uh, Most of these degrees don't require a licensing test that is as severe and devastating as the state bar, especially the California bar. I know California uh, has a reputation recently for giving out a trophy for losing or whatever, but I believe the California bar exam is still the most difficult one 
in the nation. So if you don't have a passion, you are going to get sidetracked. And just because you decide to go to law school or go on the law office study program, which is the program that I was on, if you're someone who likes to party and drink and do the regular stuff that a lot of college people do, I don't think that you will be successful. Uh, I passed up so many opportunities to go out and party and meet girls and get wild. And my roommate, you know, always was complimenting me on the fact that I was just always at my desk studying if I wasn't out walking or at the gym. So remember that. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but health is also super important in nutrition. Now, Career goals are the next thing you need to think about. So the first step is, do you have a passion? Are you interested in this? And you'll pretty much know about that. Now, career goals would be, you know, will studying law align with your goals? What do you want to do? So I got into the study of law because I used to manage a, a Bally's Health Club, and I got pulled out of my car over a parking ticket for asking an officer to show me his ID. And he got upset. I asked him if he didn't have anything better to do. Couldn't he tell that I'm working, paying his bills? He didn't like that. That's before they had body cams. He decided to pull me out of my car and try and beat me up. And I ended up suing him and getting around 30 grand in a civil rights lawsuit against this guy. And that really motivated me to get my bar card. But I had no undergrad. I'm a guy who dropped out of regular high school and got a job on an independent study program when I was, I think, 16, moved out of my house, worked as a painter's apprentice. So you're talking to someone who's totally different than these bookworm kind of guys. I'm somebody who would go to the library at night and read just because I like to read. I would attend college classes when the professors would let me sit in just because I wanted to learn. I just always had that desire to learn. So career goals have to be sort of focused around, you know, what is it that you want to do? I was inspired to do civil rights, real estate law, and personal injury law because these were all issues I faced as a business owner. Limousine company, people getting hurt in the limo. Uh, business owner getting screwed under on contracts all the time, usually by a lawyer who didn't even know what they were doing, but since they have the bar card, the judges always go for them over someone like me. At least that was the way I perceived it. So the career goals. What kind of lawyer do you want to be? Some people want to work in uh, civil rights. Some people want to work in criminal defense. They want to be a district attorney and do prosecutions. Uh, they want to get into politics, and they want to use uh, politics. They want to use law as their avenue to get into politics. So you have to decide. I mean, if you want to be in one of those jobs, they may not like it that you graduated from the law study program. For me, I didn't want to work for the government. I mean, I did as a volunteer when I was working my way up. And I was able to become a certified law student, try a couple of cases as co-chair, and do depositions. And because I was working with other attorneys, I was doing complex litigation, discovery, doing things that regular law students don't do. Maybe they'll do it for one summer as part of their law school experience. But I was actually doing the things that lawyers do so they could go out and golf or be a force multiplier and go to court. And then they knew they could trust me to get that brief done, get that appellate brief or reply brief, whatever it might be, demur, motion to compel, whatever it is, I could do it. So they love that. And I work cheap and I work free. And we'll talk about that later. Now, those career goals, if they're in academia or legal research, unless you have a lawyer who really likes and trusts you to get you into the community, you're going to have a harder time without going to a traditional law school because people in general, especially if they went to an academic institution, think that that's the normal way to do it. And they don't like it as a general rule that you didn't do it the way they did. It's just a normal thing. It'd be like giving someone an Eagle Globe and Anchor who didn't go to Marine boot camp in their mind. 
In my mind, I think it's more like the Navy SEALs to do it the way that I did it because I got that special training that lasted over four years and it was truly my passion. So you need to make sure that your career goals will line up with your objectives. If you want to work with other lawyers like me, for example, I'm going to get you into my funnel and my network of other lawyers and you'll learn enough to eventually put out your own shingle because the people I work with don't want to have employees. We want to teach you how to be your own man or your own woman and then work with you as a team. Having employees Employees don't have a stake, or at least enough of a stake, to where they're as passionate as you are. So get everybody passionate, get everybody buying a house, get everybody making decent money and a decent living, and they'll just want to keep working with you as long as they like and trust you. So remember that about your career goals. That's number two. Number three, academic aptitude. Okay. So that involves rigorous academic training, assessing your strengths in areas like critical thinking, research, analytical skills, writing ability, strong reading comprehension, and effective communication skills. They're just simply essential for success in law. So not everybody uh, who didn't have a decent education is going to have those skills. So you got to hone those skills. Now in my case, I was always an avid reader, and my parents had placed me in a Christian school as a youngster until I begged to go to a public school, which was probably a mistake. But I basically was at such a high level from private school as a youngster that I was already at a level of someone who had graduated a 12th grade public school. So that was a good thing. Not everyone's going to have that, and I recognize that, but I can help you, and I'll help you in other episodes to learn how to do better at grammar and spelling and all those things that you're going to need to pass the bar, which is a problem-solving speed exam. So if you are someone who is English as a second language or anything like that, I can help you. Okay, not a problem. So even if you think you don't have the academic aptitude, there are tutors, there are people who I know who I can set you up with. So don't worry about that. But you will need to develop all of that in order to be a, a great lawyer and pass that bar exam, which is what this is really all about, passing the bar. Okay, now the next thing, and probably I think the most important thing, but I listed it as number four because you got to open the door first, right? Time and financial commitment is super important. So law school, and in particular law office study, is going to require a significant investment of time and financial resources. I mean, if you're working for free as an intern or an extern, I mean, obviously that's going to mean you've got to work another job. What did I do? I got a job working at a Home Depot, working the midnight shift till like 3 in the morning, got whatever sleep I could, got up at oh dark 30, went over to the prosecutor's office and did law in motion for them, learned about case law, learned how to read the law under some great mentors. And, and then I did it also at a civil firm, several civil firms, and ended up getting a, uh, an externship at the Court of Appeal, which was amazing for someone on the law study program to do that. So you can break barriers, you can do it. But that time and financial commitment is absolutely imperative. You're going to have to have some reserves set aside. Example. I sold my limousine company, I slept on park benches, I even rented a two, tiny cubicle at the Yes Center in Venice, which was like this hippie commune place. So I have all my suits hung up and this basically would have amounted to a broom closet. Slept in there, had my computer set up, and these guys kind of left me alone and they knew what I was doing. And the place was a disaster. But, you know, being a Marine, I was used to living with other people. And I just went with the flow because that was my goal. I, I, nothing was going to stop me. So just understand that you're going to have to... Look, I didn't have to, to live like a pauper like that. But I needed to make sure I could afford the books. I was buying used Barbary books, used PMBR CDs and books. So I'll tell you how to do all that stuff later. But... 
the point is, is you're going to have to get your hands on that stuff, and you're going to have to put together a study guideline, and you're going to have to commit, and that goes back to the, the time availability. So the commitment is going to be serious and significant, and you have to study in such a way that you layer on the information. You can't just keep studying the same thing every day. You have to kind of bounce around, which I'll also teach you how to do. Now, you also have to have balance in your life. So just because I didn't go out and party and you know try to hook up with girls and all that, what I did do is I tried to maintain balance by always going for at least a walk every day, going to the gym at least five to six days a week. I trained like a monster. Um, you have to do that and you have to eat right. You know, make sure you're taking your vitamin D3, your vitamin K2, you're not eating sugar and screwing up your body's ability to regulate insulin. Don't listen to all these bleeding heart idiots on TV and on the news telling you you should be happy with your body image. Being fat and being obese is a sign of laziness. It's also extremely unhealthy. The only people who benefit from you being fat and unhealthy are pharmaceutical companies and politicians. They're the ones who make money by you being disabled and sick and ill. Pharmaceutical companies and doctors will donate money to those politicians and they'll keep on spreading this nonsense social engineering that it's okay to be a lard butt. I won't say ass because I don't want to be too rude, but in the Marine Corps we call people that are fat diet privates for a reason. Because people don't want to hire someone who's out of shape. People want to know that their lawyer is a killer. They want to know that that guy or gal can take names. And they want to see that by the way they look. Your appearance, your ability to look aggressive but yet civil is super important as a lawyer. There's no room for a beta in the law field. Okay, so that balance means that you may have to be greedy with your time. You may have to miss a Christmas or a Thanksgiving. You have to be greedy, and you have to explain to the people around you that if they really love you, they'll understand that because they want you to achieve their goal. You want to surround yourself with people who are motivated to see you succeed. And so disassociate yourself from people who say, oh, you're not in the uh, regular law school, you're not going to make it, blah, blah, blah. Just tell them about Mike Eline. I'll put my paycheck up against any Harvard grad and we can talk about the bottom line because I don't see too many guys out there who have had the successes that I've had. And I think you can do it too. I'm not bragging at all. I'm just saying don't put a whole lot of weight in some academic degree. Those who can do, those who can't teach. People who do and teach make better teachers. So in my opinion. Now the next thing is what's really cool about what I did is networking and internship opportunities. When you decide you want to be a law student, whether it's law school or law office study, you should be looking at uh, what types of networking and internship opportunities there are out there. And you have to find them for yourself. I would send faxes, the old school fax machines, to hundreds of attorneys until finally a few bit because they wanted a free clerk. They were suspicious at first, but then when they saw that I could do discovery, that I knew the rules of evidence, they were thrilled because they would have had to pay a paralegal 60, 70 bucks an hour to do that. And they were getting someone to do it for free. So just remember that. And once you do that, other lawyers are going to be showing up at their office, their friends. They're going to be like, who is that guy? And they'll be like, hey, that's my intern. Check out his work. All of a sudden, they're inviting you out. You become one of them because they, they want people like you. People love people who are on fire, especially lawyers. A lot of guys get out of law school. They just have this ego. They think they should get their own secretary. They don't even know how to put a header on a pleading or a footer. They don't know the rules or the local rules of court. So you're dealing with an egomaniac, oftentimes narcissist with a big student loan. Lawyers don't want to deal with, especially old school lawyers who are like solo practitioners. They're like, get out of my face. So doing it on the law study program method or using the law study program method approach as a traditional law student 
will give you those opportunities. So even if you went to like a lower end school uh, that's like a Cal Bar school or not even a Cal Bar law school, those are other ways that you can sort of work your way up your ladder. And of course, if you were a paralegal like me, even better. Um, now, the next thing is, you know, the personal commitment. I, that's number eight, but I'm, I've already sort of encompassed personal commitment in all of these other bullet points. But you have to reflect on not just your personal commitment to studying hard and to achieving the goal of becoming a lawyer. You also have to reflect on your commitment to justice and fairness and advocacy. Sometimes you might have to fight for the rights of others or address social issues that you don't agree with. But as a lawyer, you have to do it sometimes. I volunteer my time pro bono on a lot of cases, and sometimes I don't agree with my clients, especially politically. I mean, I'm a civil libertarian. I believe less government is more freedom. And, you know, in California, that's a rare person to find. Most people are all about more control over their lives, and I'm about less. But I'm still going to fight to defend their rights to say and do what they want to say so long as it doesn't infringe upon the rights of others. And when I say infringe upon the rights of others, what I mean, like, don't yell fire in a crowded movie house. But other than that, I think people need to be able to say what needs to be said, especially if other people feel insulted. That's what makes America different than these other beta male and beta female countries like Germany, for example. Now, you have to remember that all of these factors are just meant to be a guide as part of the decision-making process. It's important to thoroughly research and speak with other professionals, do podcasts, talk to current law students, talk to people that were on the law study program like me. That way you'll get a comprehensive idea and understanding about what it is and what it entails to study law with or without law school. We all know that even uh, that famous celebrity, oh gosh, Kim Kardashian, she's on the law study program. Her dad was a great lawyer. What I'm getting at is she passed the baby bar. So clearly genetics is part of this. But look, I'm a short guy and I made it through the Marines and I was always at the back of the platoon because they put the little guys in the end. So what does that mean? I had to take two steps for every step they took, the tall guys. So all that means is you just got to try harder. And that's what you got to do. I hope that you enjoyed this. I had a great time. It looks like it went 22 minutes. So it's not quite 10, but I'll strive harder to make them 10 next time. <laughs>